accelerate the evolution of medicine. Now, here's your host. So uh, last night we did some uh, rapping at the beginning of the functional forum. It went down really well. So shout out to Z Dog MD for his uh, amazing stuff. Check it out on Dying. That was great. Let's have a round of applause for that. There's some really, really funny stuff on his uh, YouTube channel. And, you know, I can't see myself as a bit of a comedian, so it does make me a bit jealous. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have some more stuff. We've got K Dog MD in the house here tonight. You know, this is actually some of my favorite uh, people in the house tonight. I'm really excited. I got some great news is that we've got an unbelievable show to you tonight. But the bad news is we may not be live in New York for a long time from now. And the sad news is good news because we're going to be going to the Royal Society of Medicine London. We're going to be going to the Cleveland Clinic in September. We're taking on the road. It's really an exciting moment. And thank you so much to our team in New York for making this happen. This is where it all started. So I just want to say thank you and pick out some people in the crowd. We've got the New York Nick's in the house right here, strength and conditioning next to a baller of his own, John Weeks. First time we get Jeff Bland live in the house. Super excited to have him. Let's have a round of applause. The Godfather. We've got Jerry Curatola. He's going to be here on the panel later, and he's here from IFM. Dr. Kelman, we're going to come and speak to you a bit later. But I also want to say hi to my friend Jenna. Give me a fist bump over here, Jenna. Organize, check it out. These guys are going to solve organ donation in two years with technology. Badasses of technology right here. Lana Kornfeld, amazing group of functional doctors, technology activists uh, for here for a leap forward in medicine. It's leap day. This only happens every four years. And I want to just start by thinking, what's it going to be like at the next leap day? What's medicine going to be like at the, ne in the next leap day? I've talked about at this time before that, you know, if we, if we look at certain trends and we can ask the trend meister John Weeks here later, but I have a feeling that in four years we're going to see this following convergence. We're going to see total switch in American medicine to value-based payments for insurance at exactly the same time, maybe a couple years later, depending on the action of this community, at the same time that functional medicine proves itself as better outcomes for the majority of chronic diseases, and that will be a certain leap forward in medicine. And that's what we're going to talk about to start with, but we don't normally do the advertising piece at the start of the show, but I just want to do it because I think it makes sense here. Look, ZDog MD is telling us we need a new chart. And I can tell you that most people hate their EHR, he was right. But there's an opportunity right now for the functional medicine community to come together and act as one and track outcomes with the same piece of software. And I think this is a unique opportunity because if we can track the outcomes, us as a community, everyone out there can make a difference in tracking outcomes today. And by the time we get to Cleveland Clinic in six months time on September 12th, mark your diaries, we can have a data set that's already extremely exciting. Never mind waiting for the Cleveland Clinic to do it. I mean, they're going to do it, but we need as many people as possible. So to go to goevomed.com slash LM. This is actually part, this is the, the second most interesting collaboration that the IFM's ever done. Obviously, this is the first. And, um, but yeah, go to goevomed.lm. You can, it digitizes and visualizes the functional medicine matrix. If you're a functional medicine doctor using the matrix, this saves you 66% of your intake time, so it's a no-brainer. And if you're a functional medicine doctor that's not using the matrix, even more reason to come and learn. So I think this is going to be a big, uh, big part of it. As ever, we are live on Twitter. You can ask me questions on Twitter, and I'll be able to bring it to the panel. We've got an amazing panel this evening. Special night here um, at the Functional Forum. You know, we did the first series, the first year of the Functional Forum, just in New York. We worked out streaming, started to grow. And at the beginning of last year, we set up this idea of having meetup groups, having building community, not just in New York, but in every zip code of America. And it started off slow. We'd have groups of five, and then suddenly there was a group of 30 that we were really excited about, and then a group of 50 we were really excited about. We have at least a dozen meetups tonight all around America. There's over 200 registered. There's probably like 100 live right now meetups, and there's some that have more than 100 people. So I want to give a shout out to, I think Minneapolis St. Paul is now the champion with the most people, but shout out to the people in LA and all across the country. The IFM Connects has been super helpful. The IFM is dedicated to helping us build these meetup groups in every zip code. We got 10 right now. We're going to have 25 by the time we get to Cleveland in September. And I just want to ask everyone out there, you know, we're really just asking to take initiative. It can't be given. It has to be taken. You can go to meetup.functionalforum.com, set up a meetup 
meet up, get the group together. By the time we bring it from the Cleveland Clinic, I think it's going to be a, a moment in history. So uh, make sure to get some practice in before then. So um, we, I typically do the news at the beginning of the show, but uh, because we're going to try a different show format this evening, um, my partner Gabe and then J uh, also John Weeks, we do the news video cast once a month. So if you haven't checked that out, you can listen to it audio, you can check it on Facebook, and you can check it on YouTube. Um, so this is the, uh, you know, the leap forward in medicine. I, we just spent the, the weekend at the Integrated Health Symposium in New York, and uh, six years ago, I went there as a lowly supplement rep. My company that I worked for, Energetics, was, it didn't even have a booth. I just showed up and I just walked around. And that was the first time that I heard Dr. Bland speak. And I was equal parts excited and frustrated. Excited because I knew that the words of this man and this movement were what was going to introduce the majority of doctors to holism in a way that they had never been introduced before. And equally frustrated that there are about 500 people in the room and everyone needed to hear it. And six years later, we have the infrastructure to be able to not only beam it out to people live tonight, but this will be sitting on the internet forever for anyone to introduce anyone. And I feel like what we have tonight is an amazing combination of science and guts and you know, belief and some amazing uh, information later on from Dr. Brogan that I think is going to sort of blow the lid on where we're really going with medicine. So it's my great pleasure to welcome for the first time live at the Functional Forum, the godfather of functional medicine. Let's have a big round of applause for Dr. Jeffrey Bland. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, Gee, Star Warsian, uh, and uh, you know we're going to be talking about dark matter, which it fits in here. But um, it's really nice because on the 29th I can say anything, and it will forever be forgotten because it's a day that doesn't exist. So that's good. So as I was listening to this introduction uh, from James, it uh, and and the wonderful uh, rap video that we just saw, what great creativity! It struck me that there is a metaphor here, isn't there, that we all believe in, or we wouldn't probably be here tonight, and that is. Uh, we have all been mired in the disease care system, and uh, every metaphor is around disease, is all around pathology, and we studied it deeply, and we sat over microscopes or whatever our pathology-based cytology courses were, and we got a certain expertise, but um, through that expertise, we also um, had a perspective, and that is that the system is all around uh, sadness. It's around uh, disappointment. It's around uh, uh, you know, tragedy. And um, we took on that psychological profile, and our, and our medicine became very mired in that psychology. And if you just think of the energy that was brought into this room tonight, that's a, that's a different mentality. That's a medicine of up and out, not down and in. That's a medicine of hope and opportunity. That's a medicine focused on function. That's why I chose the term function, because I thought it was a, a term that could be a rallying point for uh, really quantifying uh, feeling good rather than just... Uh, defining feeling bad or pathology. And in fact, the, the, the funny story, you heard me maybe say this before, but it, it actually was on my mind when I, when I chose the term uh, in, in uh, 2000, uh, because functional medicine already had some connotation uh, in 2000. It was either psychosomatic medicine uh, or it was rehabilitative uh, geriatric medicine. So there was a lot of pushback by my colleagues in these meetings where we were kind of uh, musing on founding the Institute for Functional Medicine. And, and I, I made a funny statement, which I've, um, I really believe. I said, so if we had 1,000 practitioners of various forms of disease care sitting in a room, and uh, they had all sorts of different pedigrees and backgrounds and training and so forth, and, and we, um, we asked the question, how many of you uh, want to practice dysfunctional medicine? Please stand up. <laughs> <laughs> So the counterpoint of that, right, was, uh, gee, I guess everyone want to practice functional medicine, right? So that was the, that was the basic uh, strategy. So, um, so with that in mind, I, I really want to deal with three questions tonight. Um, this is kind of the content portion of uh, my musing, um, because these are things that are on our uh, radar screen, either directly or indirectly through our patients, which are, how does this genomics revolution really uh, interface with healthcare? Is it just an epiphenomena that's kind of fun and cute and it's a new tool and we are kind of a romance by all the newness? Or does it really provide answers and solutions that we didn't have before that could be meaningful in uh, leading to actionable outcome that would improve patient outcome? And so the three questions I want to talk about that kind of um, over, overlay what, what I'm going to go through here about dark matter is uh, should we really uh, be doing um, and advocating genetic testing at this point or is it too early? 
to really be useful. And, and I'm going to say, yes, we should. So I'll just put that out there, and then I'm going to say why I believe it should. And then number two, what are the interpretive guidelines then if we're going to use genetic analysis? Uh, is it a bad news bear story? And, and I'll just tell you the story for those of you that won't be to the end here in the next 27 minutes, so I'll just tell you the end of the story. The end of the story is if you think of the way that genetic testing is being used today and how it's interpreted, it's all around the bad news of pathology. It's all around risk. And I find this very interesting, but I guess not surprising, because if you think of the whole context of our system, it's all tilted towards disease. But yet in that genome, that book of life, those 23 chapters, there's very little that actually codes for disease. Uh, it mostly codes for function. And it mostly codes for the opportunity for high-level wellness for a century or more. So how do you access the good news in that system rather than constantly focusing on disease risk, which just mires us back in the old model? So that, I just want to throw that out as a, as a construct. And, and by the way, I think all the labs that are doing it are caught up in that same thing. It's just like the term diagnosis. You know, diagnosis is, is should go out with disease. It's prognosis. You want, to have, you want to be on the front end of this curve. You don't want to be on the back end. This is the difference between like accounting and financial planning. I mean, do you want really an accountant to be running your health? You, you want a financial planner, right? Someone that's looking forward, not looking back. And, and uh, so that, that's that model. And then lastly, how do we use biomarkers and other information to make the gene test uh, more applicable to, um, to actionable things? So this all starts, as you know, with this Rose Garden thing, the deciphering the human genome. We thought we had all these answers, and then it led to this, human, this huge disillusion after spending uh, like three or four billion dollars. People thought, whoa, we got it kind of ripped off, because first we thought there were going to be 100,000 genes in the human genome, and you know, the geneticists were disappointed because they didn't have as many things to play with. And they said there's only like 22,000 coding genes in the human genome. And the Pinot grape has 30,000, and rice has 50,000. What are we? <laughs> you know, so it's like, geez, this is a little bit confusing. So um, we then have learned from there, and I'm kind of cutting to the chase, making a lot of stuff uh, kind of overly simple, that uh, it's actually the genes that are sitting in residence quiet waiting to be uh, influenced by the environment of the host so that they will be expressed in the way that the environment uh, teases out those signals. And we're really, um, you know, kind of uh, receptors of signals that come from the environment. So all these things that we're receiving, both, um, uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation through moving of sound waves that I'm doing now to uh, eating food to um, breathing air to all these things are signals that really uh, create outcome in the way that our genes are expressed. And some are, some are expressed in real time very rapidly, others over, you know, days or months or, or years. It depends on the process. So functional medicine, as I said, uh, was, was developed really to try to codify this concept. And uh, I really want to give uh, a lot of credit and attribution to my colleagues when we sat down. You know, this is my wife's real, real genius uh, after I've been traveling uh, several million miles all over the world. And she said, Jeff, you know, maybe you need to do something at home. Wouldn't that be interesting as an alternative? <laughs> and, and uh, you know, maybe if uh, we would form a group and, and why don't we fund, because we were in a, in a position at that point with our little company that we could afford uh, owning it to put our money where we wanted to. So why don't we fund... Uh, some of our uh, friends and colleagues that you have seen around the world that are thought leaders to come in and, and I'll put a meeting on and let's say uh, this was 1989 in Victoria, Vancouver, British Columbia and so we met for uh, four days and we had a whiteboard. It was no obligation to go to talk about reimbursement or licensure or any of the realities. It was just about what would a healthcare system look like if in, in the abstract it was to be perfect and so that uh, led us into really some deep uh, conversations. And I had people from all different disciplines. I had informatics people from MIT, and I had people that were biometricians, and I had uh, natural healers, and, and with people that were all at the top of their games that were willing to entertain this kind of open landscape. So that led us into some really interesting thoughts, and then we went kind of um, in communication. This is pre-web, so we, we kind of used snail mail, and we went back then the following year in, uh, in 90, and. Uh, and we met again, but now we had some guidelines and, and we, we got deeper into the granularity of what would this look like. And then, then on the Saturday night, right before the Sunday of our last day, uh, I had this kind of uh, con dream, conception, whatever. It wasn't Kekulé's Dancing Monkeys, but it was basically um, the concept that we should call this functional medicine. And as I already told you, we kind of then tested that with the group. And uh, David Jones, my bread brother, and, and, and I, and, and uh, Joe Pizzorno, and uh, a variety of other people, Leo Gallen and uh, Sid Baker, uh, were all in, involved in these discussions. And uh, out of that, then we decided, let's give it a whirl. Let's, let's try functional medicine on to see if it, it has any stickiness. So out of that was developed the tree, 
uh, that this, I recall, came out of our offices in Gig Harbor in the early days of, uh, of functional medicine. And you might recall that we had, uh, when we put our first training sessions on, I laugh at them now, uh, the, there were two five-day training sessions where we were applying functional medicine clinical practice that were separated by two months. So people had to actually come in and live in Gig Harbor for a week at t twice, and that was like a, a, a test right there, although some people like Gig Harbor. It's a little bit provincial. And, um, and then we... Uh, you know, literally, we thought if we could get uh, 30 people to show up, we were really like this was a sign of success, of which half were my family members. So <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> that was kind of the early origin. But out of that then was born, ultimately, this kind of metaphor, the, the tree diagram. And the, uh, the question now that we, we, we take in our, in our present parlance is, how do you convert the root things, uh, the, the um, kind of genetic potential, into the things up in the upper leaves uh, foliage of the tree to be healthy and robust? That would be the phenotype. So how do you convert genetic potential into phenotypic high-level function? That, that's really the question. So the genetic information is clinically applied in the functional medicine system as an, as an operating system, as I see it. It's part of the, uh, uh, the portfolio of information that you can utilize in assembling a complex uh, story about your patient. This is all about the story of the patient, right? The, the deep story from antecedents into triggers, mediators, into signs and symptoms. So like all great mysteries, riddles, and puzzles, the human genome has layers of complexity, metaphoric trapdoors, and false walls, and amazing hidden treasures. And we're only starting to learn uh, the deep uh, hidden mysteries. And I, I would be presumptuous to suggest that I'm going to give you great insight that's going to explain all aspects. Because I think that we're really uh, just in the early stages of our understanding. And the more we look, the more exciting it is. And we're in the depths of a, a revolution in biological sciences second to none. It's probably like the, what happened to the Pasteur and vector disease model at the turn of the last century, where suddenly new ahas were coming out every day. And it's just the most exciting time to be alive right now, because basically all the old rules that I learned that were the maxims that we were tested on are now like open for new discovery. And, and in fact, I had an alumni meeting with my class of um, seniors. Uh, we took our first molecular biology course in 1962, uh, and we thought we were only a few years away from Watson and Crick. We thought we knew everything, Corona, and we had the triplet code, and we, had, we understood how amino acids were coded for, and proteins were assembled. This was the answer. And so we all got, got in this, uh, after a few beers, into this discussion about, uh, gee whiz, if we took the same test we took back then and gave the same answers that got us good grades, we'd all fail. Because most all of those things that we thought were truths are now really uh, changed. So uh, the key is the genetic code, but um, there's a hidden genetic code below the, the way that we thought the genes worked. This concept of the Mendelian fixed structure of the genes and that they would always be, uh, you know, monogenetic diseases were the primacy and you have the, you know, the molecular basis uh, of uh, genetic metabolism diseases that we could understand. But those represent but a bit a small fraction of the uh, way that genes ultimately regulate our function. So it's a whole new story of plasticity. So we, as I said, have about 22,000 genes. Um, but the interesting part of this uh, that I'll be focusing on is that within the human genome, and by the way, as you know, there's about 97.6 homology of the human genome uh, in the coding regions of the gene with the chimpanzee. So, you know, that's like, ooh, that's a little too close. So what, what, what are the other things that differentiate us from rice that has 40 to 50,000 genes in us? Um, well, basically the human genome in its entirety is huge compared to any other genome. It, it dwarfs, uh, the, 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 it makes the uh, chimpanzee genome look uh, just tiny in comparison. And so all this other stuff that's in there, all this other DNA that's in there, has been a question mark for some time. People knew it was in there, but because it didn't code for protein through normal mRNA transcription, people said, well, okay, what are we going to call it? Let's just call it junk because it must be remnants. There's a lot of repeating units in there and a lot of, of redundancy, and so it must be stuff that's not that important. So we're just going to call it junk. But uh, I want to really remind us that I know I'm giving you a quick reminder of maybe some things you prefer to forget, but in the, in, the, in the biology of the gene, the molecular biology of the gene, remember that there are these uh, spacers in the, in the genes, um, and these are the introns, right? And those have to be pulled out in, in the splicing to get rise to give rise into the, uh, the genome that's going to do the, or the portion of the gene that's going to do the coding for the protein. So we assumed for a long time that these, uh, these green spots in there were uh, kind of like just who knows what. They were like insulators or something, and they, they weren't providing any function. Now, uh, as I'll go through, we recognize that they code for all sorts of information pertaining to the regulation of how genes are expressed as families. 
and we don't express genes one at a time. You know, you, you, you have these, these families, and that's what really differentiates humans from others is the complexity of how you uh, assemble and express these in, in groups. So if I asked a simple question, a kind of a um, uh, statistical question, how many permutations and combinations could you have of 22,000 genes take multiple at a time? Ha ha. Now we get into an infinite number of virtually of, of possibilities, right? And so that's the diversity of the human species. The more way they can be assembled intelligently, the more diversity and control and fine structure you have. So the puffer fish is an interest. I actually studied tetrodotoxin in the puffer fish. I was doing neuroscience at one of my phases in my earlier life. And um, it turns out the puffer fish genome is kind of interesting because it has 98% of its DNA. It codes for a protein. <coughs> uh, and so it's very efficient. But it doesn't have much executive centers of what used to be called junk DNA. So exactly the reverse of the human genome that's only 2% coding and 98% other stuff. So what is this junk DNA? This, this is a wonderful book, by the way. Um, Nessa Carey is a really wonderful writer. She's a, a molecular geneticist in, in England. And so she talks about the fact that this junk DNA can, contains within it the promoter regions of genes, the long sequence uh, uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, telomeres, which we're going to talk about in a moment, uh, short inhibitory RNAs and microRNAs. So they're all coded for out of the non-protein coding portion of what used to be called junk DNA. Okay? So, uh, as uh, Nessa said in, in the, the Junk DNA book, I quote, one shock from the sequencing of the human genome was a realization that the extraordinary complexities of human anatomy, physiology, intelligence, and behavior cannot be explained by referring to the classical model of the genes. Wow, that's a pretty compelling statement, isn't it, when we think of all the time we spent putting this stuff to memory, thinking that we had answers that we could reproduce on demand and it would be of value. Now we're saying, well, maybe it's only of limited value, that we need to be looking farther down the story. And so you look at the ENCODE project. I don't know how many of you have followed this, but the ENCODE project is very fascinating because it started looking at the full complex of information encoded in the genes, not just the coding portion for protein. And they, uh, the first published paper out of the ENCODE project uh, was in 19, uh, was in 2007, excuse me, in which they um, were able to do a complete uh, decoding of only 2% of the human genome. But in that 2%, they found all these regions that, of non-coding uh, portions of the genome that had functional characteristics, right? Fun I, I love this term because functional genomics has emerged now as the frontier of this genomic space. So if we, uh, genes can't change, but their expression does, then the dark matter of the genome is what controls the expression of genes. So if you look at that, you know, kind of mass of DNA sitting in there, that's obviously not ready to, to sell to divide. That's just kind of a distributed DNA. There's a huge amount of that, 98%, that's related to regulation of how the message is going to be expressed under different environmental circumstances. <clears throat> so, whoop, wrong way. So... This book is another one. This is another uh, British author, a uh, very, very uh, well-written uh, review, really going back to the dawn of the, the study of DNA, and I won't go through the whole history, but uh, in this book he talks about the um, uh, RNA is referred to as DNA's cousin. Uh, some scientists, however, believe that RNA may be the oldest form of genetic information. As you probably know, RNA is single-stranded. Uh, it, it doesn't, and because of the uh, having ribose rather than deoxyribose, it doesn't bend itself into the triple helix efficiently. But it does pull back on itself to form loops and to form these interesting uh, fingers that then have topological uh, structure function relationships in opening or closing portions of the genome. Now, that's a very interesting thing. That's a structure function relationship. It's the three dimensional genome, basically, if you get where I'm going. So the way RNA can fold based upon its structure, gives rise to the ability to shield or to mask or to open up certain po portions of the genome for uh, reading. And, um, and that sounds like epigenetics, right? Which it is. So your non-coding RNA has a big role to play in your epigenomic messaging and patterning over experiences. So when we look at then, as I think I've already said this, that uh, the RNA then is uh, single-stranded, uh, it, has, um, uh, it has ribose versus deoxyribose, and therefore it has a, and it also has uracil versus thymine, so there's a, nu a nucleic acid change. And so when we start asking what does it do, well, it has three major types of RNA that you're familiar with, messenger RNA that takes the message off DNA to make uh, protein in the ribosome, but it also has ribosomal RNA, and then uh, one of the members of my, actually, uh, my biotech company is uh, the, one of the founders of, of transfer RNA, uh, Paul Schimmel 
which as you know pulls amino acids into from the cytoplasm and takes it to the messenger RNA and that whole process is one of the most intimate beautiful elegant dances that you can imagine as to how that whole process as a as a nano machine really works to, to make protein but beyond those there are these other types of RNA that are within this uh, non-coding region the uh, mitochondrial RNA because remember we have genetic information within our mitochondria that's passed on maternally and then the small nuclear RNAs and microRNAs so um, uh, John Maddock just uh, wrote an article a couple of years ago on the rise of regulatory RNA and he said RNA is a computational engine of cellular biology developmental biology brain function and possibly evolution itself the complexity and interconnectedness of the genetic code with the non-coding RNA should not be the cause for concern but rather than motivation for exploring the vast unknown universe of RNA regulation without which we will not understand biology so that's really what the dark matter that we're looking into on February 29th is all about right we can't just because it's a a, a, a unusual day this is a, an un unusual day to be remembered because I think this this structure of the uh, the nucleosome and how that three-dimensional structure opens and closes to allow reader enzymes to come in to transcribe certain information is regulated by these non-coding regions which are in intimate contact with our lifestyle and our environment as I'll go on to show in a moment including our thoughts attitudes and beliefs which can change the three-dimensional structure of the genome so these are, are really, I mean, this sounds like a little bit of woo-woo stuff, but now we have the tools to really measure this, to quantify it, to replicate it, and it becomes suddenly science, right? Now it's, it's, uh, it's now accepted. So uh, this other book by Nessa Carey, The Epigenetics Rev uh, Revolution, talks about how genetic expression is controlled by the epigenome and how small RNAs play a role in masking and, and opening up certain portions of the genome. So if you look at the full genome and you ask, well, how does the, uh, in a, in a, in a chart, how do you divide up the coding versus the non-coding region? So that little blue slice up there, that's the percentage of coding region, right? And then that uh, kind of purple, that's the so-called introns, that those were the spacers that are the regulatory regions like the transcription factors and, and the promoter regions of genes. And then you get to the unique non-coding RNAs or, uh, that then regulate the structure of the genome and the, and the uh, nucleosome, which are, are playing very important roles in how we express messages. So what are the actionable opportunities within the functional medicine model for all this information? This sounds pretty esoteric at this point, so what do we do with it? Let's start with telomeres, right? Can we influence in telomeres, which are the ends of the chromosomes, these repeating units the, uh, that then are shortened with age in all animals with replication? Remember Leonard Hayflick in the 50s uh, cell doublings and you get to a certain doubling number and then the cells expire. expire because you've shortened the telomere so much that your genomic stability is lost and those genes now open up to all sorts of damage in the universe. So entropy wins in the end. That's called aging. So can you, uh, can you influence then uh, the telomere? And the answer is yes, you can because we know that healthy lifestyle now, but now we have with Elizabeth Blackburn's Nobel Prize winning work, we have the ability to measure and uh, the, uh, the amount of the length of telomeres and the telomerase enzyme. So people can say, wow, you mean if you really just do the right things uh, for, that speaks to, with harmony to your genes is you can actually preserve the integrity of the, of the protective ends of your chromosomes, which is akin to reducing biological aging? Yes, you can. That's, that's an actionable thing. You can measure telomeres and you can do something and then you can measure them again, right? So this makes this science a little bit more uh, quantifiable. Uh, same thing as, you know, Dean Ornish's work with Elizabeth Blackburn with prostate uh, cancer. Uh, these are uh, males, and again, who go on the, uh, the lifestyle program pretty intensively, and they show that their telomerase activity goes up, their telomere shortening goes down, and it's uh, associated with uh, better outcomes. So when I look at, um, at cancer as kind of the model threshold of how we're using this information, I think it's the first beachhead. It's very, very fascinating because if we go back to this twin study done in Sweden, it was published a number of years ago in, in New England Journal, you recall they pointed out with, uh, with um, uh, identical twins that there was no more concordance in cancer than there was with the population at large. So you, if it was all a genetic disease, like inherited um, uh, disease, we would have much more concordance. Now, we would say that cancer is a genetic disease, but at a somatic cell level, not at the germ level, right? It's not inherited in the normal sense. So that means that uh, genomic um, stability becomes very, very important. Now, are there ways of measuring genomic stability in humans? Yes, you can take buccal cells and look at cytology, right? And you can actually, or leukocytes, and you can look, and, and there are ways of actually simply getting some qualitative information about genomic stability from fairly simple tests. So if you put telomere shortening, 
to, or telomere length together with the buccal cell cytological analysis of genomic stability. And what did we see win the Alaska Award in medicine this year? DNA damage response element, right? What is a DNA, a DNA damage response? Well, BRCA1 and 2 are DNA damage response genes, aren't they? They're regulatory genes in men and women that control damage to genes. So women who have BRCA1 and 2 homozygous mutations that lead to higher incidence of breast and ovarian cancer, they don't have cancer genes. They have lost their protection against their DNA by a loss of function condition, right, which is, is increased genomic instability. So in looking at the serum of Chinese subjects, what has been found on rice-based diets? This is another actionable part of my story because what they found is that, lo and behold, they could find in their plasma specific examples of rice non-coding RNA after they ate rice. Are you familiar with this work? This is highly controversial, by the way, and it's, it's created a big stir in the field because what happens if you can eat information in such a way that you're epigenetically modifying gene expression? Now, in this particular case, they even went on to, to say that uh, these stable microRNAs that were are secreted and found in the serum and these exogenous plant microRNAs from the consumption of rice were found in the serum that they then, whoops, I, I missed that, excuse me, they actually, um, this microRNA 168A actually has an effect on the LDL receptor expression. So it has something to do with cholesterol feedback processes and how this relates to cholesterologenesis and high cholesterol. So this is a pretty dramatic thing if you start thinking, could we actually measure then uh, theoretically these uh, microRNAs that come from our diet and how they're influencing gene expression and epigenetically modifying a phenotype? Now just think about that if you talk about food is information. I mean, we're really getting down to a pretty fundamental level of understanding. Okay, so the microbiome plays a role in our epigenetics as well because it's sending out signals through the, uh, the immune system and through the release of various uh, agents from its own genome, uh, its plasmids, that are, that are influencing the gene expression as well. And this is a whole frontier that is just now in the early stages of really starting to understand. And we'll have tools to measure this in the near future. So when we eat, we produce all sorts of byproducts that then have effects on these uh, regulatory processes that ultimately cause our genes to alter their functional status. So Moshe Sev, a uh, good uh, colleague and friend uh, at McGill University, the, the, the father supposedly of behavioral epigenetics, he was a pharmacologist by training, uh, Israeli trained PhD pharmacologist. Um, so social epigenetics is looking at the environment and how that influence is going from a energy force field called behavior to a covalent bond of molecular groupings such as methylation of promoter regions of genes, right? So now can you actually measure quantitatively the effect of a disharmonious uh, environment such that the psychosocial energy is captured by the genome and it alters its methylation patterns? And the answer is yes. He, he's, and, and there's a huge amount of work that's, that's done on this actually, he and many others. Um, so one of the studies he did was what are called the ice babies. Maybe you're familiar with this, where the, um, there was a huge, huge uh, cold snap in Canada a few years ago. And uh, so people were just locked into uh, their places with no electricity. And, uh, and the, the, it was very, very stressful. And many of these uh, people were in jeopardy to lose their life from hypothermia. So it was a lot of stress. And women who were pregnant at that time were under a lot of stress, right? So the question was, these babies that were born, what are their methylation patterns of their genomes? Because they were born to mothers that were in some of these very fearful environments. And they found, low and bad, they're called the ice babies. They have methylation patterns that are triggered to methylating regions that control stress response. So these are now hyperreactive stress children, right, is what, is what they're finding. So these, these constructs that you can have an environment that can create a molecular change in the way your DNA can be expressed is a pretty, and it can be uh, ereditable, by the way. That's the other part of this. It can be transmissible. This is totally Lamarckian. So that's a whole nother like, oh, I can't even believe it. So that, and then you probably know the work that's done right over here uh, at Beth Israel. Uh, and this is really a fascinating example of that with uh, second generation uh, descendants of uh, uh, people that were interned during the Holocaust, right? And looking at the methylation patterns, and again, showing similar methylation patterns of, of this gene that uh, is a controller gene, a reporter uh, regulatory gene for stress response, showing that they're, they, have they have inherited this through their epigenetic uh, patterning. So what does this all mean? <laughs> I, I've given a lot of stuff, just thrown kind of to the wind here on uh, February 29th, a bunch of thoughts. But I think this is a frame shift in the way we actually see 
biology which influences the way we see health and disease, which influences ultimately the way that medicine will be practiced. And I'm so proud that we have this functional medicine operating system because it's at least a formalized system to take all this information in. It's a systems biology approach of collecting data so that we have an intelligent way of analyzing it and come to a, a conclusion that can, can lead to personalized precision in healthcare. So we're much more than DNA that codes for protein and our genome. That's obvious. Uh, the major difference between humans and all other plants and animals is this large amount of what used to be called junk DNA, our dark matter. The dark matter of the genome is where the regulation of complexity of life really resides. We're much more complex because of that than other plants. And the dark matter takes its message from the environment, diet, and lifestyle. And functional medicine, I believe, is the system that incorporates the effects of genetic dark matter in its assessment and treatment approach. It is the frontier way that we can throw through this lens the ability to understand this information and make it clinically valuable. And thanks for listening. I've enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Wow, that was really amazing. There's some great uh, information here on the screen right now about some other resources. Dr. Bland's book, The Disease Delusion, is awesome. This series, actually, uh, here you can find it at functionalmedicine.org about functional medicine genomics is, is really incredible, too. Um, so check it out on the internet forever for free for everyone. Awesome. <laughs> All right, and some other resources here. We're actually gonna be going to the AFMCP in Phoenix in a few weeks and shooting video uh, for the July Functional Forum. You go to functionalmedicine.org slash AFMCP to find out more. And look, guess what? It all comes around to the fact that what we said at the first time, Thich Nhat Hanh was right all along. Community is the guru of the future. If you have been listening to the Evolution of Medicine podcast, you've heard Dr. George Slavich talk about how the fact that relationships and community is a bigger, well, social isolation, particularly in loneliness, is a bigger driver of health than diet and smoking and exercise. So this is a serious moment and so much more reason for us to get together in communities all around the world and build it. Because you know what? Most functional, integrative, other providers feel weird. They feel like they're weird in the community, or they used to until they have this awesome meetup every month right in their zip code. So um, now's an opportunity to get together. The Twitter is out of control tonight. So I have to admit <laughs> that <laughs> In the old days, in the old days, I did cheat and pretend there were questions on Twitter that I had just written myself. <laughs> right at the beginning, right at the beginning, not in the last like year and a half. But tonight, there's no need because it's out of control. And the best thing ever is looking at the photos of everyone who's having a great time at their meetups. And uh, it's really great to be here. I want to give a special shout out to Shanna here, fist bump. Wanted to come to the functional forum last month in, uh, in Boulder. It snowed, there was two feet of snow on the ground. We still had 150 people in the venue and flew all the way to New York to come to the next one. So that's the furthest to come here. Great story. So what else is going on here today at Leap Day? We have the functional forum tonight, but we also have the start of the Microbiome Medicine Summit. Now, most of you know that we did the Evolution of Medicine Summit twice, and I almost did a Microbiome Summit because I, I basically was way ahead of everyone on the microbiome only because I heard Dr. Bob Roundtree lecture in 2012, and he laid it all out, and no one knew anything about it, and I knew everything about it because I just listened to Bob for two hours, and I sort of basically built this whole thing on that. But the Microbiome Medicine um, Summit is happening right now. Now, a few familiar faces. Uh, Sayaji, who spoke on the last functional forum, the macro implications of the microbiome. If you liked his half an hour there, you get a whole hour here. Dr. Mark Hyman, you know, Dr. Mercola, and Dr. Kelman's here in the house. Welcome. You can see his, uh, you can see his session um, from the functional forum a year ago. We did one, the March functional forum last year. Dr. Kelman's right here, did a great session on the microbiome. You know, this is truly, I, I recognized it then, and it's so true that this was a, a, a sort of a, a, a topic that brought everyone down to the same level because no one knew anything about it and as I say in my interview and people have been tweeting it at me all day is that once you understand the microbiome you cannot reject holism all right so we're going to talk about a little practice transformation tools I just want to mention you will never hear about any supplement companies or lab companies on the functional forum and here's the reason why the ecosystem of functional medicine all around the country is being built right now and the people that benefit the most from that are the supplement companies and labs. But guess what? They are stepping up to pay for this whole infrastructure to be built. They are sponsoring the functional forum meetups all around the country. So if you're watching for this and you work for a lab or a supplement, this is a land grab, right? The next six months is going to determine whether you're part of the ecosystem or not. So if you're watching this, you have an opportunity in the next few months to build the ecosystem in your community. And all it takes is initiative. I can't give it to you. You have to take it. 
All right, so we're going to talk about some technologies. Embody 360 car is in the house. Uh, launched at IHS uh, 2016 just last weekend. It is an amazing technology for being able to improve your ability to gain adherence and compliance. There's some amazing tools in there. Active tracking, passive tracking. Go to uh, goevomed.com slash embody to find out, um, to be one of the first practitioners to be able to use it. Igbo is a big fan everywhere we go. This is the Uber for phlebotomist, rapidly increasing the efficiency of chronic disease management. It's not that great in New York. I'm just going to tell you that, but no labs are good in New York, and it's not Igbo's fault. Um, but I can tell you that, and she didn't know that I was going to put this on the functional forum, but this is my wife. And this is, this is my wife here, and this is an Igbo, just so you know which way around it is. Um, and uh, she is being serviced here. You can see she's just uh, got her blood drawn for a functional lab test just this week. So we're, we're using it too. But essentially, if you're a doctor, you can use Igbo to have a little Iggy, which is a guy basically in an Uber car, come to your house and do the blood draw for any of your specialty functional medicine labs, and the lab pays for it. So it's a win for everyone. Uh, we also have HealthWave. They've been a sponsor for a couple of years. It is a best-in-category e-prescribed e platform and um, bringing out some great new technology to integrate your online and offline inventory. As a result of having the offline inventory, you can now put any product from any company in there. It's completely, um, it's completely supportive of all of them. And also Freedom Practice Coaching. So they've been a supporter for a long time. And here are three people that came to Freedom Practice Coaching from the Functional Forum. This is Dr. Corey Feldman over here who started of the Chicago meetup, Dr. Stephanie Clark and Dr. Hilda Maldonado. You may remember she did the um, one of the Evolution of Medicine uh, movie screenings, the film festival last year. A few women kicking ass. It's awesome. So exciting to see that. So speaking, yeah, not surprising. And yeah, I'm glad you bring that up, Kate. I love a bit of heckling because you're right on time with this. Because look, this is right on time. If you've been listening to the Evolution of Medicine podcast, you know that there's been a change of tone recently. And we've started this thing called the Leaders of the New School. And I'm not going to... I'm not going to, you know, tell you exactly, I'm not going to, um, you know, I'm not going to give the game away because, you know, there, there's someone in the room tonight that deserves a lot of appreciation, Dr. Kelly Brogan, she stepped in on the very first functional forum, kind of made it cool and, you know, has got tons of views for all of her content on psychiatry. She's been in both the Evolution of Medicine summits. Uh, this is her fourth keynote. She has really influenced my ideas. We need a way of communicating to the general population what this shift is in medicine. And I'm not sure if epigenetics and genetics are going to do it, because you have to be Blandian to like really <laughs> right get there. I really think there is a simpler way to communicate the difference between the new medicine and the old medicine. And Dr. Kelly Brogan is going to kick it right now. All right. I feel like post bland, I should like scrap my talk and just do an interpretive dance or something <laughs> instead. <laughs> it's really a rough transition, but I'll do my best. All right. So I just want to ask how many people in the audience feel that something amazing is happening right now? Totally. Totally. I do as well. And if you ask anyone who knows me, I've had a bit of an attitude adjustment over the past couple of months. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what I've been working on letting go of and what I'm working on embracing. So like any ontological process, right, there are many parallel layers. And I think many of you probably are experiencing a personal process that seems to mirror something that's also going on on the level of global consciousness, right? So I spent the better part of my adult life really living in what could be described as my masculine energy, right? My first email address was Kelbro at Hotmail, and I thought that was like a clever combination of my first and last name, but really I think it was more a nod to my inner bro, because I've been always a very righteous person, very sort of management-oriented, a doer, a fixer, and somebody very interested in mastery. So these were some of the things that I used to believe, uh, largely nurtured by my conventional training, right? that science is truth at any given time, that the one who knows the most science is, of course, right, that there is a right and a wrong, a good and a bad, that there's a rational explanation, of course, for everything that deviates from what science would predict, that there is an urgency always, and that misfortune really comes from laziness and lack of preparation. So this was my story, 
And there are many forefathers to this story, right? To this idea that we are here put on this earth, as Alan Watts would say, flesh robots on a dead rock floating in the middle of nowhere, right? That we are put on this earth to lord over and to exact our power and force over the natural world, right? And so an unintended consequence of this perspective is that we end up feeling fundamentally separated from nature. And of course, the extension of that is separated from each other, our communities, and even ourselves, our, our own souls, spirits, and minds. So the posture of this story is one that encourages a warring stance, right? So what is medicine today? It's antibiotics, it's anti-hypertensives, it's antidepressants, right? And so we continue to position ourselves against what we have labeled as bad, wrong, or in need of domination or eradication. And the problem is that we continue to use more and more failed science and technology to make up for the failed science and technology. So the type of medicine that this culture supports is, of course, one where the human body is a machine, right? It's made up of a, you know, bags of different parts and largely predetermined genes. We put calories in, and of course the environment is largely irrelevant because we're impervious to it, right? And the, you know, the nature of this experience of ourselves really ends up influencing us from a, a top-down layer. And it ends up being a, a, almost like a, a predetermined medical system applied to the impersonal patient. The beauty is, of course, as we've discussed, that science is a journey. It's a process, and it's certainly never a destination, lest it be a dangerous force. We've made many, many mistakes. I think we all can probably agree, right? We once thought, even when I was a medical student not too long ago, that the brain was a privileged space, you know, that there was no immunity uh, occurring there. We thought the womb was sterile. We thought that DCIS was a cancer. We thought, of course, that genes equaled disease. In 1949, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for the therapeutic lobotomy. Not so bad. And of course, there are multiple oopses, right, in the realm of the pharmaceutical industry, of course. But none, as James has mentioned, has had the paradigm shifting, patriarchally decimating effect that our awareness of the microbiome has, right? No longer can we even define ourselves the way we used to. No longer can we even perceive this skin to be a barrier between myself and the natural world, right? Our you know, maternal inheritance of ancient uh, bacteria in the form of mitochondria, of course, recentering natural birth in its righteous place, in the, the, the very vitality of our species. And in many ways, what this has done is forced medicine to surrender back to nature. So this is the new story, and I think this is what we're starting to feel into. I love the term the holobiont, right, because it necessitates a holistic view of our interconnectedness with the natural world. It's about cooperativity, co-creation. It's about shared and reciprocal interests, right? That in fact, what is good for the planet, what is good for you, is in fact also good for me. And of course, it decimates all of these false boundaries. They're just blown away by it. And very importantly, it's a non-hierarchical system. So just as we look to modern hunter-gatherers, for example, and we sample their stool and try to examine their microbiome to figure out you know, where we should be going with this information, we might also start to look to them, to the nature of their very day-to-day -day existence, to what they tap into that helps them experience something that we are in many ways seemingly missing out on. So this notion is referred to as the continuum concept, right? And it's this idea that we have evolved over millions of years to expect on a physical, emotional, and spiritual level to expect a certain relationship with Mother Nature and with our own mothers, in fact. And that any departure from that relationship will start to pull on us, right? And we'll start to feel that pull because something will feel wrong something will feel like it's missing, and something will feel off. And I think many of us can describe our experience 
as being characterized by that sensation. So this is the new medicine, right? It invokes a trust in the body, a connection to the environment, food as, of course, information, and a sense of community. And in this type of medicine, symptoms are a message. They are an invitation to begin to examine how far from that continuum have you strayed. And in this type of medicine, we are looking to inspire an experiential knowing. Right, so what I do in my practice with patients is invite them into a healing experience so that they can know intuitively what their bodies are capable of so that they won't need me anymore. So as Nick Gonzalez once wrote me, let the current system exist in a parallel universe and start from scratch with a completely new system that's based on nutrition, psychology, and spirituality. Prescient man. And the most important message here is the one that I struggled with the most, which is that this isn't about warring, right? If it's not going to be about warring, it shouldn't be about warring. So that means it's also not about fighting the current system. It's not about women as being dominant over men either. It's about awakening a feminine principle in every person and also in the systems that we engage. So as Candace Pert said, the science I have come to know is unifying, spontaneous, intuitive caring, a process more akin to surrender than to domination, right? And in many ways, this is what I'm beginning to understand, is that as much as I love data and science, science is really intended to inspire a state of awe and wonder. That's its only purpose. So Thoreau said that it takes two to speak the truth, right? It takes one person to speak and one person to listen. And it's my passionate belief that more and more people than maybe ever before in human history are ready to listen. And so I want you to feel into these concepts, sit with them, and see if you're ready to choose this different story. Thank you. On the internet forever for free for everyone i'm super excited and uh i'm yeah i'm very happy to support kelly's book and we often like to have to make it <laughs> there's a rumor going around that i physically attacked a pot plant during the ihs during my session with john weeks it's true and i got it on video so you'll see it in may all right so um so uh we're gonna continue the conversation thanks so much dr kelly brogan watching jeff nodding along all the way through that was was really amazing too and i, I feel um the power of that connection there uh the divine feminine is coming to medicine you better watch out because it's going to be awesome all right so um I want to just let you know that we're going to have a panel now, so get ready with the questions. We've got tons of them on Twitter. We're going to need those chairs here for the panel. Um, I wanted to let you know, all of you, you're going to see some familiar faces here in a minute, but it's really exciting to see different media channels coming and backing the functional medicine revolution. And uh, Dr. Jerry is in the house. He's going to be on the panel. We've also got John Weeks, uh, who's a big fan. So uh, check out the new TV show coming to millions and millions and millions and millions of people on PBS in May. It's called The Dr. Jerry Show. We'll be back in just a minute with the panel. As a practicing dentist with an integrated focus, I've long believed that our oral health is the missing link to our total health. Once I started looking at the mouth as the gateway to total body health, I began to understand what so much of the newest research now supports, that everything we put in our mouth, from the food we eat to what we drink, the medicines we use, all of it impacts our total systemic health. So we want to empower you, the viewer, with practical advice and to take what we're about to share and use it to live a happier and healthier life. And I've invited some of the greatest minds emerging today in medicine, nutrition, fitness, healthcare, oral care, and more. So the microbiome is all the microbes that live in and on the human body. There are many more bacterial cells in our body than there are human cells. So I've been talking to some of the doctors leading the charge in functional medicine, who look at how our whole human body system works, looking at the root causes of disease and not just the symptoms. And the important thing for people to understand is that the microbiome is very much related to inflammation, and inflammation is often at the root cause of so many of our chronic diseases today. 
and that makes a happy guy. Where are there places where people live to 100 consistently without chronic disease? I saw there are different things in different areas, but the one thing they all had in common was a really strong sense of community. We hope we've opened your eyes to a whole wealth of other possibilities for how you can start thinking about your health. You know, I love learning and sharing this information, meeting all the exciting people who, like me, are devoted to reinvigorating healthcare and empowering you with the best information for your health. Community is the guru of the future. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we, we started here. Jerry, uh, thrilled, to, uh, thrilled to have that. I'm gonna come to the question I wanted to ask first, but I gotta ask Jeff, can you just give us your thoughts on what you just heard from Kelly? Well, I, I, I was just telling her. Um, You're good. Probably the best way that I could say it uh, from a very personal level is I had sons, I had three sons. I, I still have three sons, but I now have uh, daughters-in-laws and I now have granddaughters. And, um, I believe that this uh, energy of the, of the feminine, which is coming into our world in very positive and needed ways, is going to be uh, taken, the gauntlet is going to be taken up by uh, my granddaughter's generation. And I'm very proud to see how they're being raised by their parents to really um, feel they can do anything and it's all up to them. And uh, I was just telling Kelly, her message is a me message of inspiration for all of us, but I want to make sure my granddaughters hear it. Thank you. What a wonderful thing. I knew I should have done that. That was amazing. Um, I just have to interrupt for a moment. I, we sort of had a deal that I was going to tell everyone who were in the meetup groups that they should turn off the TV now and have a discussion about what they just heard in their groups. I don't blame you if you don't turn off because this is going to be awesome. But I just want to um, just let you know that we are trying a few different things with the forum next month we're going to start an hour earlier and see how that grabs you um, this is that you know for an hour but um, for those who want to stay you're welcome I can promise it's gonna be amazing but you can turn off if you want um, okay so John Weeks I want to come to you because you put on the most amazing slide in your talk that I saw last year and it said uh, alignment and this was actually from the Lancet and it said um, there were three eras essentially there was a, a the Flexner era where we needed experts there was the formative era where we need professionals now there's the transformative era where we need change agents. I just want you to talk a little bit about this because I feel like if there's one thing that we're trying to do here at the Functional Forum is stimulate everyone to be a change agent. I just wanted to, you know, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I thought this was like the best slide that I saw last year. Very good. It's <clears throat> first pleasure to be here and I, I must say that every time I hear you, Jeff, I, I get a sort of a contact smart <laughs> for a little while. But I'm not sure if they had a three-week follow-up or even a three-day follow-up if it necessarily would have all stuck here. Uh, but, but listening to it, I was affirmed. I've been around, Jeff and I have known each other for a long time, to when I first was drawn in in 1983. I worked with the naturopathic doctors at Bastyr, and they taught me that they looked at this process as removing the obstacles to cure and aiding and abetting the healing power of nature, and I think I was hearing that in your presentation, that, that confirmation. Um, so this slide uh, comes from a lot of my work has been in bridging between what we're doing sort of outside of regular medicine and what really are some really fine progressive voices and movement inside of regular medicine. And, and a lot of the work is finding the abutments in regular medicine where you can go and find them and, 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 and link in. And, and this process at the Institute of Medicine uh, Global Forum, uh, we've been involved for, for four years. It's got all of the main educators and uh, you know, the, the, the councils of colleges for all the main professions are represented there. And then there's a global um, focus to it. And it's on innovation and in health professional education. It was set up, how many of you know the Flexner Report, right? This was set up at the 100 year anniversary of a report that was celebrated for years and years and years and years. And now there's a revisionist view of it because the re report actually sent us into tertiary care, it sent us out of community health, it sent us out of, of uh, public health, and actually uh, moved investment in that direction and frankly uh, left us not spending enough time on the determinants of health. And so what they did is that the, in honor of that, this, the Lancet brought out this report from which this, and then there was another report out of Robert Wood Johnson and the IOM on the future of nursing, which itself was very important because it was sort of an emancipation proclamation for nurses and that they analyzed data on nursing 
primary care practices and nursing anesthesiologists and found that in both cases they did as performed as well as medical doctors doing the same work. Well that essentially broke the hegemony of medical doctors running everything. And what it did is it opened doors for everybody, right? Because once, once that sort of happened once, there has to be an acknowledgement that, well, maybe somebody else could be in the driver's seat here. Maybe it's an acupuncturist at the moment. Maybe it's a massage therapist who knows the most about what to do in a given moment. And so it opened up this movement towards interprofessionalism, which is part of the values-based movement that James referred to. This chart was buried in the back of this 40-page Lancet study. And I pulled it out and used it over and over, in part because going into that environment and having somebody talking about change agency, I kind of went, whoopee, you know, <laughs> it's my time, it's our time. And, and what they were referring to is that in this world that we live now, we're in a, it's international, it's more global, so there's a movement of population and there's a movement of ideas. The traditional medicines that many of us use and are influenced by in many ways, there's much more movement. There are populations that are accustomed to using those, those therapies and practices that are here. Um, we have this realization we need to break down, frankly, the tertiary care institutions, sort of tip some of that money out into the communities. And that's where most of our practices have been germinated and are still being germinated, is, is out in the communities. Um, and it, of course, is something that the uh, functional forum is doing very well, is that, that, that the rapid change in technology is creating huge changes. And with these kind of series of changes that are going on, they realize that educating somebody with the idea that you can learn everything and be an expert, it's like forget about it. You know, what you can learn to do is, is, is learn how to, the phrase I liked, I went back to the study to try to find it, and I couldn't find the exact language that was talked about when this was first brought up, is, is actually it's an era of living with ambiguity. You know, it's not that time of, we, we know it all, it's very clear. It's realizing, and that gets into how do you research whole systems? Mark Hyman was talking about that. Um, you know, at Cleveland Clinic, they're looking at how do we actually measure the black box of functional medicine. Let's not worry about right now what's in the black box of an integrative practice. Let's actually just look at what happens with the black box first. Let's be comfortable with that ambiguity. That might be the way for us to go forward. If we want to back off later and ask the ancillary questions about what was most influential, fine. But really, we're in a pretty sad situation with our medicine. It's time to be thinking about another example of that is, is in the opioid response. You know, I've, I've learned in it that while we're seeing more respect for non-pharmacologic approaches showing up in many, many places, it's one of the very fine developments for integration and potential for us now is in integrative pain care. Mm. It's not getting into the opioid world as much because there haven't been studies funded that have specifically looked at you and have any of you helped somebody move off of opioids or through situations that might have needed opioids? There haven't been a lot of studies funded to actually look at that process. So they sit down and review the literature and you don't see it. So the ambiguity is, as you say, well, listen, if the Joint Commission has decided that we should have, you know, acupuncture therapy, chiropractic therapy, massage therapy, uh, relaxation therapy, physical therapy as part of our routine um, therapies in uh, pain care, maybe we ought to be able to make the connection that perhaps with a problem like opioids as big as it is, yeah. we ought to go ahead and move some of this in. It's a huge point, and that's why we're getting these groups together, these practitioners together, learn from each other and do that. And I really appreciate everything you, sh you shared there, John. Uh, Jerry, I want to come to you and ask you, like, what, what does a leap forward in medicine look like from a, from a dentist well, perspective? You know, one of the reasons why I was passionate about doing that show um, is that, you know, the Dentists are, are often like the uh, the weird cousin in the healthcare family, you know. <laughs> we, we were portrayed in, in shows like the old Bob Newhart show, the dentist was the weird guy. But um, the truth is, is that I've always known that, that the mouth is really both a gateway and a mirror for what's going on in the whole body. 
but there was a dysfunctionality that Kelly spoke about and that bad science and bad medicine gets re repeated by new bad science and, and perpetuates something like the use of fluoride or dental amalgam, mercury containing fillings that I'm embarrassed to say even exist in the dental profession. But the real breakthrough, everything we know about disease has changed. As Jeff, you pointed out, you know, we're in this new frontier. And um, the oral microbiome, for example, is uh, linked to everything from Alzheimer's to colon cancer. Three studies just in 2016 have emerged. Uh, women's health, pathogenic bacteria from periodontal disease, this imbalance in an oral microbiome. We know it's a dysbiosis. But pathogenic bacteria uh, from periodontal disease in women's placenta, seven times higher incidence of preterm birth for women with gum disease. Men, um, I'm giving a talk this Friday about periodontal disease and the effect on erectile dysfunction. Men with, uh, with gum disease have a over more than 50% higher incidence of erectile dysfunction affecting more very interesting, it's not an old man's disease, it's men in their 30s, 20, between 20 years and 40 years old. Um, brain health, um, not just Alzheimer's, which there are a lot of studies uh, linking that together, but in brain health, you have intracerebral hemorrhage uh, being caused by pathogenic bacteria in the mouth. Um, especially fusobacterium, nucleotum, and these kinds of things. The big problem is the therapies we're using right now. Okay, we need to get out of the detergent bug killing business in oral care. Okay, we need to really um, get away from the scorched earth policy of killing germs on contact. I don't want to name brands, but the leading <laughs> tube of toothpaste in America that makes $4.3 billion dollars a year uses a known pesticide in the toothpaste to kill plaque. And then they show um, Kelly Ripper with her white teeth saying, this is great, kills more germs than anything else. Well, those germs in your mouth keep you alive. They aid in digestion. They even, um, you know, I've spent 17 years in oral microbiome research. And, um, and I'm happy to say, um, we have, you know, something I developed called Revitin, R-E-V-I-T-I-N, Revitin.com. I don't have a slide to put up on the book yet. <laughs> but, but at any rate, um, this is designed as a prebiotic because the key, I believe, in the gateway to wellness is in oral microbiome homeostasis. Absolutely. Not in killing germs, but in rebalancing this natural ecology of the mouth. And what, we've det what we found is that our, 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 really the expression of our oral microbiome is as unique as our thumbprint. Yeah. So th in terms of the leap forward in medicine, James, I think the mouth is on the forefront and your dentist is on the front line of your ability to live a longer, healthier life. And we want to be part of this functional medicine community, which is why I'm, I'm really proud to, to be here and to, um, and to be working with such a fantastic group. It is like uh, the scene in um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind where we had this consciousness and we're all being called and we're making that mountain with the flat top in our living room. <laughs> that's a good reference. Yeah, I think that's, uh, can I, can I yeah, of course. Really, really quickly, uh, uh, you know, what I find, and your comments just resonate to me so, so strongly on a personal level because oftentimes we, as providers, have a lot of knowledge and then somehow that knowledge doesn't sink into our own lives. So let me give, this is a mea culpa. So for years, I was working on periodontal research as it relates to the immune system with a, a whole group of very dedicated dentists. We published papers on this. And I was playing basketball one day, and I got hit in the mouth, and I um, uh, had an injury to one of my lower teeth that required a root canal. I had the root canal done by uh, a friend who was another basketball player. He was one of the top uh, in Adonis in our area, and he lectures all around the world, very good at his work. Um, and then a, a, a number of months later, not putting this together, not putting this together, a number of months later, I started to get a sinus problems, right? I'd never had sinus problems in my life. 
So I thought, geez, I'm, uh, I must be I'm getting allergic to living in the Northwest. Well, I've lived here like 20 years. Why did I suddenly get allergic <laughs> to the Northwest? And so then I was, you know, I was getting congested all the time, and I had drainage. Then I got lymph glands started to be swollen, right? And it was on that morning I thought, oh, this is not a good sign. This is bad. And then I suddenly looked at myself. I said, your root canal, Jeff. Now, it turns out that I had written the foreword for George Meining's book <laughs> <laughs> about the dangers of root canal. And yes, it was a best-selling book in the, in the 80s. I mean, so uh, just to, to really reinforce what you're saying, so as soon as I got that problem cleaned up, I, that was like 15 years ago, I haven't had any sinus problems since. So. You, know, you, know, you know what, Jeff, what you're saying is so true is that many dentists are in the dark. You know, they're doing things because they learn this. And I'm trying to start a uh, Center for Integrative Dentistry at New York University. Uh, hopefully, it'll be the first in the country. Um, but I'm getting a lot of pushback. We, New York University was the first to take mercury out, you know, dental amalgam out of the clinics. And then they got a lot of pushback from the American Dental Association. And they had to offer it if someone asked for it. So they don't offer it to a patient. But if they had to put it back in or it would affect their accreditation and other things. So we really, you know, it's groups like this, that, and great dentist Martha Cortez here, and Luke, Lou Gross is, is here in the, somewhere. He's got a fun hat, but, um, but it's, you know, we're, you know, we're just, we're sort of even behind, I think. In medicine, I see many great physicians moving forward into this, what you said, um, uh, John, about, and, you know, this uncertain territory. It's a new territory. We're on the moon. Yeah, absolutely. We're really on the moon here. Uh, but it's exciting, and it's great. And I think there's, um, there's a tremendous um, consciousness that's, that's building and it's resonating. And spiritually, I think it's even resonating. Kelly, I want to just come to you on, on that point here because, um, you know, Jeff said something amazing in his, in his talk there. It's like suddenly he just knew it was the root canal. And uh, we'd be talking about this leader of the new school. What, you know, what are your thoughts? We, we had a podcast recently, and, and check this out because I think it was one of the most um, profound things that I've ever recorded, where we, we sort of came to the conclusion that in the era of complexity, reductionism is less valuable, and we need new tools, and potentially intuition is one of those. So I'd just love to have your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mentioned even in, in our conversation, um, you know, uh, Alan Watts, whom I have a mild and enduring obsession with, uh, talks about this example that maybe some of you heard, but I think it, it's the best way to convey it, right? He talks about uh, a heron, right? So a bird is on the edge of a lake, and the heron essentially has the option to, to dart around, you know, trying to survey the entire scene looking for where a fish might be, right? And so this like frenetic sort of earnest effort, right? And that that's operating from the space of the mind. But if that heron were to just sit back and take in the entirety of the landscape with a sense of trust in its ability to act when called upon essentially, that the tiniest ripple will draw its attention exactly where it needs to go and it will be able to execute exactly what it is designed to execute, right? So that's operating from a space of intuition. And so that's the feeling that we're looking for. It's really hard to find when we've been conditioned so extensively around uh, the power of mind and intellect. But the way that you find it is, at least in, in my experience, is that you sort of sit in, in, in the most curious posture you possibly can about something that is really freaking you out. Right, so just take like, like 12 seconds to stop being freaked out, because freaking out never serves anyone, ever, uh, and, and just sort of develop a curious mind. Like, isn't it interesting that I feel this way? Or isn't that interesting that I've had diarrhea for 14 weeks? Or isn't it interesting, <laughs> you know, whatever it happens to be, just to cultivate a sense of curiosity, I think, then engenders an experience of trust in, in a process, and maybe connectedness to a greater whole. So Absolutely, and Jeff. I want to come. Can I? I want to come back to you on this actually. And I, let me just ask you a question. Then you can go whichever way you want with it. But you and I, Kelly and I, had recorded that podcast uh, when I met you at Scripps, and we had an amazing conversation. And I said, you know, I think that there are all these doctors are looking at intuition as a as a way of dealing with complexity. And you had a sort of a a sort of count, not really a counterpoint, but a counterpoint that I thought was really valuable. I'd love everyone to share because I, I thought it was really uh, incredible what you said there. Well, I, I want to play off 
what Kelly said and segue to you, and I'll try to make it very, uh, hopefully, time bounded here short. Um, I had an experience today, Kelly, that was reminded me of exactly what you're talking about because as I was walking uh, down Avenue of Americas today, I went by a park and there was a bunch of jugglers in there. And I was remembering when I learned juggling. I, I, I tried really hard to learn juggling and my sons got really good at it really quickly. It really ticked me off. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were just like little guys and they were juggling all over the place and I was falling, dropping the balls and it was really <laughs> aggravating. And, um, and then one day, and those of you who have done things like this, you know what I'm speaking to. One day, all of a sudden, I got out of my mind. I got into my state and I juggled just immediately, boom. And I don't think it was because I'd been practicing for a long time. I was in a state function to be prepared to juggle by being in that moment, right? And, uh, and I think that this concept of intuition uh, and, and how it relates to complexity is that when you get comfort, comfortable with the fact that we live in a complex universe in which all the answers will never be there and we strive as, as organisms to try to understand but we will never gain mastery of understanding and that that becomes part of the joy of living then you can have these discoveries, right? They, they just come up like you, start and you suddenly start juggling. And uh, it wasn't because you practice getting mastery of complexity. And, and I, I think that's a form of what we call intuition because what you're doing is you're really going to a primal state that's in all of us somehow in the deep code of that three-dimensional structure in our beingness that converts uh, you know, sunlight energy into motive thought and power of the human body. There is resonant in all of us that, but if we we have pushed it away, and you said it very beautifully, because we don't get tested on that stuff, right? It doesn't, it doesn't end up in true fault questionnaires very easily. John? John, we have to use the thing, because no one can hear at home. Uh, we are, yeah, I mean, do you want to answer that, Kelly? Are we socially conditioned the opposite way was the question. Please just put your hands up. We have all, we can, yeah. Certainly, Cer certainly. I mean, that's what part of what I tried to depict is that, you know, some would estimate estimate there were about 5,000 years into patriarchal orientation and there are many theories um, you know about what ushered in that transition spanning from the development of an alphabet to agricultural um, you know initiation and, and relating to the world as uh, and the natural world as as something that needed to um, serve our needs in terms of like a utilitarianism rather than sort of like a co-creation and a balance and a harmony with the environment so there are a lot of theories about how we've gotten into this place but I like to think now if you asked me a year ago I would, <laughs> wouldn't have felt that there was any need for us to be exactly where we are now but I like to think that we needed to go here you know we needed to stray as far as we've strayed we needed things to get really off and and for our species to be sicker than ever in its history we needed that to happen to awaken this pull back like I said to the continuum so it's all poetry it's it's all exactly as it should be and so there's nothing to be depressed about <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> let's go back to the book yeah, uh, yeah, Jerry. I wanted to just ask you just uh, your your thoughts here. I mean, you've just gone through this show. You've been interviewing all these like functional medicine leaders. Were there certain things that came out of that show that speak to this conversation? Absolutely. Um, I think you know um, one of the common denominators. I think from everyone, and it's this has been so such a blessing to me to be able to do this. And we're you know this was really um, just a quick little promo. Uh, the show will air in mid-May, um, and it was actually picked up by the ION Network as well. So there's a lot of interest. Um, I kind of uh, went into this thinking, oh, this will be more, it'll be a higher brow Dr. Oz, you know. We're not going to be talking about Garcinia, Cambodia, and, <laughs> and things like that. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but but um, the common denominator was there was a passion and a love for what every doctor, person that was on the show um, was doing. And that gets ties into what you were saying, Kelly, um, and you as well, Jeff. And that is that um, if we could just get to that state where we think positively. I read a book a long time ago, Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief, how what we believe can change our DNA. And now we're seeing the science of that um, with what Jeff was presenting and how 
what we have in our in our in our conscious mind has a profound effect and transcends um, so much of the physiology of our bodies. Um, and I really think you know. So I try and you know, it's all this um, two words, right? Think love, you know, because love is this universal current that heals and binds and connects, and it's on on so many different levels and. You know, uh, like the Beatles, all we need is love. You know, it seems such, like such, you know, like a nice song. Now we know there's a science behind that. Absolutely. And I'm really excited about that. John, I just want to, yeah, let's have a round of applause for that. <laughs> for sure. John, I just want to come back to you here on this, on a question because, you know, I know we've talked a lot about functional medicine tonight and, you know, some people identify with other labels, naturopathic, integrative or otherwise. And I think part of your work has been to sort of bring things together in certain terms. I know you wrote an article recently about how there's so many naturopaths sort of leading the charge in functional medicine. Where do you see these sort of levels of, of cohesion between all these different professions that we're, we're representing in the functional forum? Great question and a fun one to answer here, particularly kind of this homecoming with being here with Jeff, reminding me of some very early days in a, you know, a, a old elementary school that is now Bastyr University, and uh, things were, uh, you know, Joe Pizzorno, who was the founder, um, knew Jeff, and they were part of a study group with Betty Cutter down in, in um, Olympia, and Jeff was on the first board there, and I think Joe was on your first board, basically. And um, part of my interest is in, is in this. I think that as a, as a change agents, um, together we can actually have more power than if we work as a single disciplines. The, the bigger we aggregate ourselves, the better off that we're going to be. And so I think it's, it's important that we know, um, it's, it's, a, I, 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 it's a fun, concept that really came to me at the AIHM meeting last October. If you're sitting around in a group of people who are in integrated space that, in that uh, is appreciating the contributions of multiple disciplines and multiple lineages, then who are your ancestors? It's my belief that actually your ancestors actually, you've got, you take on new ancestors at the moment you fully accept yourself as part of a team and it's part of a coalition or a collaboration that's doing it. That, that these other, and, but in order to do that and move forward, um, and this is actually in the science of interprofessional education, that you really, they, they say that um, in this movement, that in order to fully understand another profession, you need to know its historic power relationship. Because if you don't understand that, for instance, let's put it in, in a classic way, if a nurse is typically habituated to not speak up even though they have the goods that we need in that moment, then, then you're not going to work to make sure that you call that out. You've got to know something about that history. So in, to answer your question here, is, so it's, it's been fun. You know, we had a panel on the Cleveland Clinic doubling in size as so part of what, uh, it's functional medicine. And I began to think how functional medicine, this wonderfully kind of sleekly designed model with these pods that are going in there that are really health coach, nutritionist, MD, functional medicine practitioner. As a political move, it's brilliant because there's nothing offensive to regular medicine in that trio. So it's, and, and we need to think politics a lot of times. But if you think of how we, ended up in this situation where they'll be doubling to 17,000 square feet and they've got 1,100 person waiting list. Well, part of it was, as Mark said in the article that I wrote about the naturopathic contributions, he says that, that functional medicine was based on a lot of the precepts of naturopathic medicine. So it kind of got a supercharge in that moment um, of, of that base. And it was a lot of thinking, a lot of tradition there. And then kind of all of those CAM disciplines started evolving in the 80s and they actually gave birth to integrative medicine. In the, in, and and that, that gave birth to a movement where there are now 60 plus medical schools that have integrative medicine programs. One of them is at Cleveland Clinic. Yeah. And so part of what's happened with functional medicine, it got a supercharge again by the integrative medicine work. It was easier for Cleveland Clinic to accept a partnership, in fact, it was probably a necessary antecedent to that partnership, was the development of the integrative medicine movement. And so when we see that how our lives are tangled in together like this, 
I think we're more likely to begin to see the power of us continuing to move forward and um, uh, find out how to cohabit so we can jointly uh, move the energy we need to. Let's have a round of applause for the community here. So um, I just want to end with a couple of final thoughts. And uh, it's been so wonderful. Thank you so much for your amazing contributions on the internet for free, forever. So excited that everyone will be able to see this. There's one thing I learned from Dan Craft this weekend from Exponential Medicine is that there, you know, we, there's an exponential potential to the future of medicine. This is the details from the Functional Forum as of a few days ago. We have a quarter of a million views. And you can see it's starting to uptick. Uh, we have over 3 million views of uh, of, of time watched and it's going up. The average minute duration is 13 and a half and it's going up. These things can move exponentially. YouTube can move exponentially. I'm gonna call on everyone who's watching this at home, share this. If you have doctors that you know have, have um, belittled you for your thoughts, share Jeff Bland with them, share Kelly Brogan with them. This is an allopathic conversion machine that we have just created <laughs> and I'm very excited to be part of it. And it has exponential potential because it can be seen by a billion people at no extra cost. That's the beauty of the internet. Um, function, Meetup.functionalforum.com. John mentioned the Foot Cleveland Clinic. On September 12th, we'll be in the Cleveland Clinic. These are some of the upcoming dates. April 4th, next month, Evolutionary Medicine, live from San Francisco with Chris Kresser, Dr. Dale Bredesen, and Dr. Stephanie Daniel. In Monday, May the 2nd, we're going to have an IHS 2016 recap with Dr. David Perlmutter, Dr. Daniel Kraft, and the Community and Digital Health Panels. Uh, on Monday, June the 6th, live from the Royal Society of Medicine in London with Dr. Rangan Chatterjee and the working title for his talk is how I reverse chronic to, 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 if I, how I reverse two cases of type 2 diabetes in 30 days in front of 4 million people on BBC TV stick around for that one we'll have Dr. Michael Ash Monday September the 12th live from the Cleveland Clinic Get your teams together. Get a meetup going. It's going to be a transformational evening. And then there's one other interesting date coming up: Monday the seventh, the Monday the seventh, uh, November the seventh. It's going to be the night before the election. So uh, maybe we can be a, uh, a swing vote here. <laughs> and uh, depending on uh, how I feel at that point, I'll tell you who to vote for. Um, so this has been the Functional Forum. Thank you so much for being here, and good night. <laughs>